And so third in this section is Catherine Lewis, um, who's going to talk about neuropsychiatric applications. I don't know if you are able to find your own slide or what. Uh, Let me give you an introduction while we are doing. So Catherine is a um, professor of genetic epidemiology and statistics at King's College London, where she leads a statistical genetics unit. Her multidisciplinary research group identifies and characterizes genetic variants conferring risk of disease, including depression, schizophrenia, and stroke. The major focus is risk assessment, determining how polygenic components of mental health disorders can be measured accurately and used in clinical care. Catherine, thank you. Thank you, Annika. Great. It's a great pleasure to be here this afternoon. Okay, so I'm going to talk about psychiatric disorders um, and uh, think about how polygenic scores might inform us about diagnosing, preventing, or treating psychiatric disorders better. I'm going to look at uh, a slightly earlier area in, in the pathway towards using or not using polygenic scores in clinical care that we've heard earlier, partly because that's where we are in psychiatric disorders. But there's four things I want you to remind you about as you listen to the rest of this talk. First of all, that psychiatric disorders have a massive burden worldwide. They come second to cardiovascular disease in years lived with disability. Secondly, diagnosis is really difficult. We have no biomarkers, we have no yes-no tests, it's by expert opinion and checklists. Third, they kill. The limited, the reduced life expectancy in people with schizophrenia is 15 years. Um, and, uh, and fourthly, our treatments are very disappointing. Only a third of people respond to the first antidepressants prescribed. So anything that genetics can do to help ameliorate all those areas would be really valuable. And I'm going to talk through some of the areas where I hope that might happen. Now, we've heard a lot about polygenic scores in risk assessment, in risk stratification, but I also want to look at how they might be used in other places in the clinical care pipeline. So first of all, in the presence of an environmental risk factor. Secondly, when someone has symptoms or is seeking a diagnosis. Thirdly, in deciding what treatment to prescribe. And fourthly, in prediction of the course of illness, which can be dramatically different for the same diagnosis. So to start off with risk, um, and we're going to contrast what we, where we are with psychiatric disorders compared to the cardiovascular and cancer that we've heard about. So this is where we are with schizophrenia. This is the latest uh, GWAS here, 77,000 individuals, quarter of a million controls, 287 loci, which really shared important insights into the biology of schizophrenia. Um, but you can see the numbers, and I'm sure you, you can interpret these as well as I can now, that this explains very little of the disorder liability, an AUC of 0.72. Um, I'm going to talk about three different disorders, schizophrenia, which I've just presented, and that's a summary on, on the first line, also bipolar disorder and depression, which is my particular uh, focus uh, analysis, and you can see that in all those we're making progress with genome-wide association studies, but it's taken hugely large numbers to be able to do that for all the reasons that, that I've just given you. You can see our latest depression, GWAS, we've needed half a million controls to be able to uh, identify that many loci. And then you can see on the right-hand side how the SNP heritability uh, compares to the twin heritability, uh, as in most disorders, much lower, about fourfold difference there. And then the polygenic prediction, um, the R squared, of under 10% of the case control uh, status explained there. So what does that look like? How do we turn those into, into some of the nice figures that we've seen? So this is uh, the uh, a population distribution of schizophrenia polygenic score here. Um, if we add the, the cases, there's a prevalence of about 1% uh, in cases, and I'm going to scale that up, and so you can see the shift over to the right here for um, schizophrenia cases. Um, and what that looks like, if you do some of that uh, dividing up the polygenic uh, score, um, which is very useful in, in research studies, um, we get this 16-fold difference in risk um, between the top and the bottom, 10%. 
um, deciles there, really useful sort of information for research studies. But for a more clinical application, we need to look more this sort of distribution where we're cutting off the very top 1% here and comparing their risk to the uh, rest of the distribution. And this uh, is only a six-fold increase in risk. Um, and so when you convert, sorry, yes, yeah, six-fold increase in risk with a prevalence of 1%, that's an absolute risk of 6%. So exactly as we've heard for cancer and cardiovascular disease, this is really not uh, allowing a lot of prediction there. Um, but one of the things that I want to think about here is where else might these polygenic scores be useful? And certainly in depression, we're seeing that this tells us something about the heterogeneity in the disorder. And this is the Australian Genetics of Depression study, where they had about 15,000 uh, cases of depression. And the graph on the right-hand side shows how the polygenic scores for depression stratifies severity of disorder by the number of episodes reported. And you can see much larger um, beta per standard deviation of the polygenic risk score for those reporting 10 or more episodes compared to those reporting uh, one or two. And this is the sort of outcome uh, that we have very little information on at an initial diagnosis, um, but would be uh, very useful. And we've heard a little bit about um, consumer genetics uh, through these talks. Um, one of the sites that I uh, worked with was Impute Me from Lasse Folkerson, which is, is now closed. Um, but he enabled people to upload their genotype data and calculate polygenic scores on a long, long list of different traits and disorders, um, just showing where your score lies, lies on the distribution compared to others. But the way that he chose to present these was by alphabetical order, so starting with aortic an, um, uh, aneurysm there. Um, and what this enables you to do is to get a handle on what it is that people seek. So everyone starts looking at the disorders starting with A to see how this works, and then they scroll down the list and pick the disorders that they are interested in. And these are the top 20 disorders that people look for on Impute Me. And highlighted in red are those for mental health disorders. So you can see that this is a huge interest of people. And I think that's something that we cannot uh, deny is the um, interest in um, risk and in particular for um, psychiatric traits. So I said I'd put this in context of some of the other risk factors that, that we have. Um, this is a, a nice study from Carmel Choi in Harvard, where she looked at exercise and polygenic scores for depression. So the literature suggests that exercise both reduces risk of depression and hastens uh, recovery from it. And, and she showed using electronic health record data that this also worked across polygenic scores. So she just divided uh, polygenic scores for depression into three groups and looked at risk of incident depression, so into, um, diagnosis within two years of lifestyle questionnaire in those that had a reasonable level of exercise and those that didn't. And you can see, first of all, that the bars increase um, for polygenic scores uh, um, in, in general, so that we do get some prediction of depression risk there. And in each case, the bars for those that exercised are lower than for those that didn't. So uh, indication of uh, gene um, combination of genes and environment uh, for risk there. Um, one of the major risk factors for depression is childhood trauma. Um, and we've uh, done quite a lot of work here to see if there is an interaction here with childhood trauma and genetics um, that doesn't interact with any of the major traditional candidate genes we've thought of. And we've looked at uh, polygenic scores here. This is a study from the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium where uh, we looked at cases and controls with both genotype data and information on childhood uh, trauma measures um, and, and tested for a uh, prediction from both of those. Uh, um, uh, and you can see that we get main effects from both the genes and the environment, so polygenic score and trauma individually. Um, 
uh, are associated with, with case status there, but there was no interaction between them. So showing here, and then the sort of model on the right-hand side there, that the impact of trauma on risk is the same across um, all polygenic scores and vice versa, that the impact of polygenic scores is, is equivalent um, uh, across uh, levels of, of trauma. This is a really nice study that came out of uh, Sri J. Sen's lab in, in Michigan. And because one of the biggest predictors for depression is stress and can trigger an episode of depression. And he looked at uh, people entering a highly stressful environment. This was interns entering their first medical um, experience uh, in the US. Um, and he looked at these uh, physicians at, at baseline, collected their polygenic, uh, um, or, or collected their uh, PHQ-9 scores uh, for levels uh, of depression. And you can see that the, the depression using a, a threshold of 10 there is, is very low. During the internship, that increased substantially, as one, as one would expect. But in the graph on the right-hand side, he looked at how polygenic scores for depression um, impacted um, risk of depression at baseline, and you can see that the line by polygenic scores is almost horizontal there, but under these high, highly stressful environments, the, um, the level of uh, depression increased substantially and now was associated with polygenic scores. So um, again, giving us some indication of um, uh, relationship between stress um, and, and genetics there. So moving on, I wanted to think about how um, polygenic scores might have a place in um, looking at outcome and, and diagnosis uh, in psychiatric disorders. So one of the most um, scary and challenging uh, psychiatric events is a first episode psychosis, which often happens in adolescence or young um, adulthood. And uh, my colleagues, Victoria Rodriguez and Evangelos Vassos, have looked at how polygenic scores might be used to predict the eventual outcome after a first episode of psychosis, whether that is um, a schizophrenia or a much milder um, a type of affected psychosis. And they looked at polygenic scores for the three disorders I've talked about, depression, bipolar, and schizophrenia, and showed that at the first uh, level here, that uh, polygenic scores did discriminate uh, statistically between the schizophrenia outcome and the affected psychosis. Um, so affected psychosis had lower schizophrenia scores and, and higher um, depression scores. And then at the second level within the affected psychosis um, cases, um, there was uh, discrimination between uh, a bipolar diagnosis and, and psychotic depression, um, uh, with bipolar disorders having a much higher schizophrenia polygenic scores. Um, and that enables you to construct what might be a typical distribution of polygenic scores here across those three um, uh, different outcomes. And I think one of the points I want to make here is that we would never get a sufficient cases for, for example, psychotic depression to be able to develop genetic predictors of that disorder itself, but showing that we have some prediction by combining the polygenic scores from the, the more common well-studied disorders puts us in, in a place to use that information. Um, and the second example is one of the most devastating uh, um, uh, course of disease outcomes from uh, psychiatric disorder is a suicide attempt. We know that over 90% of people that attempt suicide have a psychiatric disorder, but they, um, the, there are very few predictors. There is no predictive model that, that identifies who is likely to attempt suicide well. So we looked at... Um, whether polygenic scores were associated with suicide attempt. And interestingly, across those three disorders there, in each case, it was the, pol it was the polygenic score for depression that was predicting um, a suicide attempt, not the individual scores for each uh, disorder. Um, and then finally, treatment. As I've mentioned, our treatments for psychiatric disorders are, are, are very disappointing. In depression, which I work in uh, most closely, 
Um, only about a third of people respond to the first antidepressant that they're prescribed. Many need to go on um, to um, second, third, even more um, treatments to find something that's effective, with a third of patients being um, classified as treatment-resistant uh, depression. So one of the things that we're working on currently is to try to identify um, polygenic profiles that might uh, suggest which would be a good starting point for an antidepressant to prescribe um, and might even be used to, uh, to suggest for some people that psychological therapy might be a better treatment. Now, here, what we really want to do is to increase the number of uh, people that respond to the first drug they're prescribed from a third upwards and even if that is quite a modest change that's a lot of people getting better quickly remembering that it can take several months to decide that a, an antidepressant is not working um, so with the aim of increasing the proportion of people that respond to their first drug we've done a um, uh, an international study uh, it's my postdoc oliver payne across uh, diverse uh, trials and clinical studies here um, this data, like everything we work with in psychiatric traits, is really messy. The graph in the top left is individual level response across a 12-week trial. Um, and you can see, on average, the depression scores decreasing, but not consistently and with a lot of noise. Um, so these are always going to be challenging. We're going to need large sample sizes to get around that noise. Um, we use an outcome um, phenotype of, of remission where people fall below a threshold for diagnosis. Um, and with 5,000 people across these studies, you won't be surprised to see we don't <coughs> find genome-wide significant uh, findings there. But we do find evidence for heritability, 13% um, when we pool genotype data, higher if we take account of um, heterogeneity between those studies. <coughs> and, and so the, the next thing that we did was to say, well, okay, if we can't find good polygenic um, profiles from uh, polygenic scores with uh, using remission, are they associated with the scores of the disorders that we've looked at? Um, and so you can see here that um, depression polygenic scores do not predict remission. So it looks here as though treatment, the genetics for treatment, is different to the genetics of susceptibility. We see um, those with higher uh, polygenic scores for schizophrenia have a less um, respond less well, um, and also some positive uh, results from uh, educational attainment, which is probably more to do with adherence um, than anything uh, biological. So this is my sort of take-home message for where we are and where I think we need to go with polygenic scores in psychiatric disorders. Um, I think we are doing reasonably well in research studies. Um, as we've said, this needs to be expanded across ethnicities. It's nothing, um, we've had that already before. But we are getting um, information on nosology, on heterogeneity, overlaps between disorders. But we are very far, even with the ideas I've presented to you here, we are very far from being able to um, apply those uh, clinically. Um, and I will finish there. Thank you, Annika. <laughs>